Tinder has over 500 microservices that talk to each other for different data needs and use a service mesh under the hood. If you've never heard the term service mesh before, don't worry, I will come to that in a bit. So Tinder has microservices for different purposes, as you would imagine. Recommendations API, Match API, Revenue API, and so on. There are different application teams within Tinder that are responsible for each specific part of the app end to end. For example, the recommendations team takes care of how recommended candidates show up on the client's phone and how the backend algorithm works and stores the data. If you've seen one of my previous videos on self-contained systems, you would probably recognize this pattern. Every end-to-end -end team is basically free to choose their own tech stack and an architecture to fulfill a specific goal. But to better understand how Tinder was even able to maintain those 500 microservices in the first place, we gotta go back to the service mesh. A service mesh is a way to control how different parts of an application share data with each other. Let's imagine we have a Kubernetes cluster with pods that hold our microservices. The need for a service mess in this case comes from the fact that first, microservices can only communicate with each other whenever they know each other's endpoints, all right? So all of that has to be configured for every microservice and that adds overhead. And also Kubernetes cluster can have a firewall and all other measures sitting in front of it, securing it from the attackers, but the communication between the services is not secure at all. There are simply no rules. So an attacker can potentially access everything if it gets inside the cluster. That's additional configs that need to be added to each microservice. Also, how do you ensure data consistency between services? Of course, you would need to have things like retry logic. And what about monitoring and, and logs? As you can see, adding all of that logic to every microservice one by one and probably configuring all of that on a cluster level can be cumbersome. And this is why maintaining 500 microservices by default wouldn't scale that well. But what if I told you that you could outsource all of that to a service mesh and that's what actually Tinder was doing. For example, by using the service mesh solution like Istio or Envoy, Tinder actually uses the latter. Under the hood, Istio or Envoy will initialize a control plane that injects a proxy into every pod. So it will run next to your microservice. So every communication between microservices will first go through proxies instead of hitting the services directly. As always, you'll find a link in the description in case if you wanna learn more about the service mesh. But let's get out of that service mesh topic. This was just to explain how it works. So if maintaining so many services actually worked pretty well for Tinder, then what was actually causing the issue? Well the API gateway. The API gateway sits between a client and a collection of backend services. It's a single entry point into a system that encapsulates the internal system architecture and provides an API that is tailored to each client. It also has other responsibilities such as authentication, monitoring, load balancing, and so on. Microservices typically provide a fine-grained APIs, which means that clients would need to interact with multiple services, resulting in too many HTTP calls to fetch recommended people in the user's area, for example. That's why an API gateway can provide a single entry point for the client that would gather all the needed information from microservices and provide the client a single entry point that it needs. Actually, the term BFF, that doesn't stand for best friends forever, but rather backend for frontend, is another name for the API gateway. A GraphQL service would be a great example of the backend for frontend pattern because it sits between the client and the server or the cluster and never the database. In this case of Tinder, the main issue they had was due to the fact that each team had a different third-party gateway solution built on a different tech stack, which brought up maintenance overheads and compatibility issues with reusing some components. So basically what Tinder needed is the following. Bringing all external facing microservices and gateways under one single umbrella. And some kind of an artifact or a piece of code or I don't know, a script that could be used by any application team to spin off their AP own API gateway to scale their application independently. Also, a design that could support configuration-driven API gateway development 
for increased development velocity. We'll dive into that in a minute. And a custom middleware logic for various features like bot detection, schema registry, and so on. And all of these requirements led Tinder to one thing, building their own custom API gateway abstraction that they called TAG, or that stands for Tinder API Gateway. So all external facing APIs would now be hosted on the Tinder API gateway, aka tag, in order to centralize them and facilitate maintenance. Also internally, this would mean that services go through a security review before being exposed to the outside world, which is an extra advantage. Of course, there are many open source and commercial gateway solutions available to the public, but some of them are really heavy and focusing on B2B integrations, and some of them are actually very complex to deploy and maintain. Things like, for example, Amazon AWS Gateway, Express Gateway, and Kraken DB were not optimal for Tinder. One of the few reasons were actually that they were not very well compatible with the service mesh that we talked about. Also, some of them were configuration heavy and use built-in plugins to support different features like spike arrest, service callouts, so an adoption had a steep learning curve. And finally, they didn't have this flexibility that Tinder needed for its own use case. So let's explore the tag. What does tag look like from the inside? Tag is a JVM-based framework built on top of Spring Cloud Gateway. It basically provides classic gateway features like routing, path rewriting, rate limiting, and so on that come out of the box with Spring Cloud Gateway with extra neat features on top. Also, application teams can use tag to create their own instances of API gateway by just writing some extra configurations, let's say in a YAML file. Tag also extends components of Spring Cloud Gateway to provide generic and pre-built filters. Let's look at an example of a request coming into the gateway to understand what filters are, first of all, and how filters are going to operate with the request that just came in and just to have a better overview. So by looking at this diagram, the first thing that we see on the left is the reverse geo IP lookup, RGIL. And that's the first thing that the incoming request is going to face. RGIL is implemented as a global filter in tag. So in this case, the IP of the client request is mapped to a three digit alpha country code, which is then used for rate limiting, for example, or to ban the requests from a specific region and other purposes. Then the second step would be the request response scanning. It's also a global filter that captures the schema of the request and not the data attributes for, for GDPR reasons. For example, Amazon MSK is used to securely stream the data, which can be consumed by application down downstreams for a variety of use cases like automatic schema generation, bot detection, and so on. And of course we have session management as a filter, basically a centralized global filter that is written into tag to validate and update and control session management. Then as we get into routes after these filters have been applied to the request, we have predicate matching. So the path of an incoming request is matched with one of the deployed routes using predicate matching. Then what we have in this pink box is the service discovery. The service discovery module in TAG uses Envoy, aka the service mesh that we already talked about before. So the Envoy is going to look up the mapping for the matched endpoint. Then we're also going to have some pre-filters. All right. So we discussed the global filters. Now we're going to have pre-filters. Once the route is identified, then the request is going to go through the pre-filters. So pre-filters are executed before the request is forwarded to the backend service. All right. Weighted routing per route and HTTP to gRPC conversion are basically some of the pre-filters available in tech. Then we have post filters. In the, in the bottom or below the pre-filters. After receiving the response from the backend service, the response goes through the chain of post filters configured for that route. So post filters are filters that are executed after the response is received from the backend service. For example, logging is one of the post filters. And then finally, we have the return response. So after completing the list of post filters, the final response is being returned to the client. The teams at Tinder or application teams at Tinder are using tag as a standard framework for building their own API gateways by just writing a couple of configurations. So their own specific configuration and they can be scaled individually when needed. Tag is also used by other dating companies like Hinge, OkCupid and so on. So it's kind of become a standard in this 
realm of the applications, which is very interesting. All right, guys, if you learned something new today or if you enjoyed the episode, always make sure to smash like because it's really going to help the video to be shown to other fellow developers. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'm going to see you in the next one. And if you're interested in this kind of similar topics where we dig deeper, dig deeper into the architecture of the app, make sure to check out this playlist. I'll see you in the next one.